Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is engineer, inventor, and founder of DW Fern, Doug Fern. Doug, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to see you. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, and thanks for having me on the show. Um, I've been listening to a lot of your podcasts, and of course, I'm very familiar with your gear and some of your history. And I think I'd like to start off with a little bit of your background, because you talk a lot about being exposed early on to classical music, not just from the perspective of listening to it, but from the perspective of seeing it being recorded, experiencing that. And of course, the whole idea of recording everything to one mic or a few mics and recording everything live, that's got to have had an influence on your development as both, a, both an artist and a recording engineer. Well, I think it was very influential. And I don't think I appreciated that for most of my life. Um, it's only been maybe in the last 10 or 15 years that I, the, the light suddenly went on. And I said, that's where it all came from. And that was mostly as a result of a documentary that was done about me. And the guy making the documentary pointed that out. And I said, wow, that's right. And my father was in the Philadelphia Orchestra. He played French horn. And I'm the oldest of four kids. For whatever reason, he took me to orchestra rehearsals pretty regularly. And he never did that with any of the younger kids. So I don't know why I got that experience and they didn't. Um, but that was an amazing experience because we're talking about a world-class orchestra in a fabulous concert hall, the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. And me as a seven-year-old, you know, like wandering around the empty hall, listening and realizing that, wow, if I sit over here, everything's out of whack. I hear like the timpani is just like overpowering, but I can hardly hear, you know, the, the cellos. And so I, you know, that really informed me, even as a kid, I, for some reason, picked up on that. And because my father did not like recorded music, he didn't listen to it. Uh, he just thought it was, you know, just too far from reality to be worth his time. I grew up not hearing recorded music. So music I mean, was just something that was created live? Yeah, in my mind. Uh -huh. I mean, we had a television set. I would see things that had music on, you know, coming out a little four inch speaker on a television set. But, but as a child, you don't put that together necessarily. No, I don't think so. So, uh, you know, aside from going to the um, rehearsals and concerts where I realized it sounded very different with an audience than it sounds with an empty <laughs> hall, um, you know, it, it was that was what I was exposed to. And my father played in a woodwind quintet that would often rehearse at our house. So I would sit down there and I must have been really little because I can remember being small enough to fit in a really small space in this studio my father built in the basement for teaching. And, uh, you know, sitting right in back of, you know, the best bassoon player in the world and the best oboe player in the world <laughs> and, and just sitting there thinking, this sounds amazing. You know, I just love those sounds. And I've and I've always been attracted to the the low end instruments, you know, the double bass, the bassoon, the tuba, mm -hmm. things like that. I could do a bass player here, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but when it came to recording, the Philadelphia Orchestra did not record at that time in, in the Academy of Music because 
I think it was either RCA or Columbia, whichever label they were with, because it changed over the years, didn't think the that hall had a long enough reverberation time, even empty, which was weird because I thought it was plenty long enough. But for whatever would reason, would be long enough longer than any studio space at that point. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, except maybe Abbey Road Studio One, maybe. Um, but uh, as a consequence, they recorded at a hotel ballroom just down the street in Philadelphia, which which had a long reverberation time. And actually, when I listen to the recordings made there, it's a really nice sounding room. So it's a good choice. And, you know, these recordings back then, this is in the 50s. Um, they're mono. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they recorded in stereo, it was just they brought in a two or three track machine and just ran it because maybe someday they'll use it for something. But it was, the recording was basically mono. And... Uh, so maybe they needed that extra long reverberation time to compensate for the mono. I, I, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, they would not let me be there during the recording, which is understandable. Would you let an eight-year-old <laughs> in a classical session, you know, imagine what that costs? Sure. And the kid sneezes or knocks something over. Right. You know, right. I, I, I wouldn't have done that, I don't believe, but. Um, but still, it's not a chance you're going to take. Yeah. Right. So I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. um, but I could be there when they were setting up and when they were running things down. And, and I spent all my time in the control room, which was just a room in the back, you know, they had adapted for a control room. And I just thought that was a magical place. You know, it was like I'm hearing this stuff coming out of basically one speaker. In retrospect, it was probably an all tech 604. And, um, you know, it sounded a whole lot better than the, than the speaker on the TV set. So I, I think I came to realize that maybe recorded music could sound okay. Uh -huh. uh, but that was my background. And it wasn't really till I got to high school that I started listening to recorded music. So, you know, my whole orientation is to what real instruments in a real space played by real people sounds like. Well, there's another component to that too, which is what the interaction between the musicians sounds like. And that's something that I think, you know, certainly changed with the advent of multi-track and overdubbing. And, you know, at this point has, has evolved to the point where musicians hardly play together at all. But I think, you know, that also had to have influenced your early understanding of music, not just the creation of music, but the recording of music, because you really are, in a certain sense, capturing a moment and an energy. Yeah, that's true. And there were occasions, uh, usually with a guest conductor that wasn't going to object, uh, where I would sit on stage with my father during the rehearsal. And it was there that I came to the realization of all the time delays in a symphony orchestra, mm. because the French horn section, the way uh, Eugene Ormandy, the, con the conductor, had the orchestra set up, was on the right hand side, you know, two thirds of the way back. And when you heard something that was coming from, you know, left front, there, there was a delay, you know, a perceptible delay. Sure. And I think I picked up on that by watching the conductor and realizing that what I was hearing on his downbeat was arriving at my ears from different directions at different times. You know, now out in the hall, the timing was fine as long as you weren't in a terrible seat. But, you know, it was it was a pretty interesting thing to me. Well, yeah, especially understanding at that point from the perspective of a player, because you're sitting there with the orchestra, understanding that, you know, this is one of the things that the conductor does. He doesn't just keep the energy going, but really helps to sort of compensate for those timing delays between people on a very, very large stage. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, that, 
Um, I think that that experience of being in the middle of a bunch of people making music together had a big influence on me too, because in my recording career, I, I've always cherished those sessions where you have a lot of people playing at once. Yeah. And I, you know, I had to do a lot of sessions where it was just me and one person, which is fine too, but there's just something magical that happens when you've got everybody playing together. Oh, I agree. And that's, you know, that to me is one of the things that I, um, you know, it's interesting. I was just having this conversation with someone earlier about the idea that, uh, you know, I was just, um, I've been teaching a college course in recording and a lot of the students that I have worked with have literally never had the experience of being in a room with a band playing live. You know, people play off of loops, they play off of beats, and certainly you can make music a, a million different ways and it's all valid and it's all, you know, it's a creative process of some sort or another, but I think there is a real irreplaceable value to the idea of musicians playing off of each other, the variations, the, the variations in timing in energy in all of these different things that happen when people are actually creating that music live, as opposed to playing off of another recording. Oh yeah, that that's certainly true. And the, and the other thing that happens is when you have a bunch of people, you know, studio players that come in and they've maybe only heard the demo a few times before the session and, and they come in and they start interacting with each other and saying to the artist, you know, how about if we do this? Right. How about you know, if we punch it here? How about if we drop a right. beat here? Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, why don't we just pull it back a little bit in this verse, you know, and you would never get that recording people separately. Well, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I do a um, I do a panel every year at the NAMM show that I call Capturing Lightning. And a lot of that has to do with those happy accidents that occur when people are playing live together and how how that magic really works to create those moments that you really don't expect and you can't prepare for and how I think, you know, there's a certain psychology there. And this is something that we were talking about earlier off camera, the idea of the left brain versus right brain, you know, the, the technical aspects of playing music versus the intuitive aspects of it. And I think at a certain point, when you've got people together in a room playing together, studio musicians or musicians who sometimes musicians who have never played together at all, but, but often when you have people who've played together uh, frequently, you get these moments where they just, you know, you read each other's minds to a certain extent and you have these, these magical occurrences that you just couldn't have possibly anticipated. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, sometimes I'm just sitting there watching a session and just saying, how does this happen? How do these people communicate with each other so beautifully? Yeah. And, you know, they're all on the same page on the music. I mean, not literally on the same page, but, you know, they all have the same interpretation. Yeah. They all have the same dynamic sense of, of the piece, you know, yeah. all those things. And, it, you know, it's just mind boggling to me. I feel so lucky sometimes to be a fly on the wall when those moments happen. You right. Know? Yeah. I mean, I get a sense of it because I don't consider myself a musician, but every once in a while I end up adding some little part to something or another, you know, and I know what that feels like when suddenly you've lost all contact with reality and you're just part of the music, you know, so from even from my non-musicians point of view, I can see how amazing that can be. I have likened it in a certain sense to falling in love. You know, you um, I've had these moments, like, especially as a bassist, I've had moments locking in with a drummer mm -hmm. where something has happened and we'll both just be in the same place at the same time. And something will just come out of it where you just look at each other and you, you know, you lock eyes and you just feel like, Oh man, there's this, there's this almost, th this almost ethereal connection there. And I think right. that's part of the creative process that you really, 
you can't prepare for. That's right. And sometimes when I'm working with people that don't have a whole lot of experience playing with, you know, a bunch of other musicians, um, I will say to them, you just let that drum track control your fingers on your guitar. You know, yeah. I, I barely have to say it to a bass player, but, you know, a singer songwriter, I might be on piano, you know, whatever instrument they're playing. I said, let that, that drum part be your fingers. Mm -hmm. And that seems to really help them to, to understand that concept. I think so. And I think that, you know, that's an understanding of ensemble playing and, you know, not to toot my horn as a bass player, but I think that bassists in particular do have that understanding because it's not a solo instrument. Right. You know, and so you yeah. really have to be, you have to be that bridge between the rhythm and the melody in that sense. And you have to really lock into all the other players and you have to be paying attention to all the other players and leave room for them. You know, that's that, that great quote from Miles Davis about the space between the notes. Right. You know, and learning to listen. And I think, you know, it's funny. That's one of the things that I took my students up on early on in the course was we're not even going to talk about recording for the first couple of classes. We're not going to talk about any of the technical aspects of it. We're going to just critically listen. Mm -hmm. You know, I want you mm -hmm. to listen to these tracks. I want you to pick out this particular part or that particular part and listen to how they fit together. Listen to how they play off of each other. I think that skill in itself is really valuable to the creative process. Yeah, I would agree. I, for a couple of years, I taught a course for um, a university near me that, that for their music department it was a required course on recording for all music majors, which was interesting because, well, first of all, I had a, you know, it was a pretty small class, but I would have, you know, a third of them that were really into it and really interested a third of them who never showed up because they didn't want to really be there. And a third that were sort of in the middle and may have learned something, may, may have not. But I always started the first day of class by saying, let's take a look at how a recording's made. And I go through the process, you know, there's microphones, there's people, they're playing their instruments. It's going through this and this and this, and then it's going, you know, onto a vinyl record or a CD or a streaming service. And then there's somebody at home listening to it or on their earbuds, taking a walk or in the car or whatever. So what are the most important parts of that whole chain? You know, people would say, oh, it's the microphone, it's the speakers, you know. And after we went through everything everybody could think of, I say, no, you're missing the point. It's the person making the music and the person listening to it. Uh -huh. You know, because I wanted to get the technology out of the way because I think that all too often people get so hung up in the technology that they miss the whole point, you know, and, and that takes a while to get past that because it's all pretty exciting at first, all this beautiful gear and all sure. this visual stuff going on on the screen. All the twinkly and lights and everything and the yeah. faders and, oh, you know, sure, absolutely. But, yeah. you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a good segue into one of the things that I wanted to ask you about because you – you came up with both this understanding of the critical listening process through your exposure to classical, but also a very heavy exposure to technology. And, you know, there is that whole left brain, right brain balance of being, creating an environment where that creativity can flow. And part of your equipment part of your your philosophy in designing the gear that you have created has been to really try and remove that left brain or not remove it but shall we say place it where it belongs mm -hmm. you know it's the same way when a person is learning an instrument when you're first learning it there's a lot of left brain there's a lot of technique there's a lot of learning um brain to finger coordination and all of that. But at a certain point, a musician reaches a point with their instrument or any artist reaches a point where they're not thinking about the technical aspect of it anymore. They're not thinking about the, the act of doing it. They're just doing it. 
And that's where the intuitiveness, that's where the right brain creativity comes in. And your, your design philosophy has really adhered to that a lot, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that brings up so many different things that I, that I could comment <laughs> on. But historically, <laughs> you know, even in those days when I was six or seven years old, I was sort of fascinated by technology. And, you know, back then, TV sets were not all that reliable. So the TV repairman would come around when your television stopped working and repair it. They're right there, usually, right there because it was usually a tube or something simple. And I would be like right there with him in back of the TV set saying, what is that? What are you doing there? What does this thing do? Go away, you can't know? you bother me? <laughs> yeah, well, they were a little more polite than that, but it, mm -hmm. that was sort of the attitude, you know, because yeah. I think I was asking them questions in retrospect that they didn't know the answer to really. Sure. So, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I started... I guess the first thing I built uh, was a crystal radio set and I could pick up a couple of radio stations in Philadelphia. And, uh, and then I, I think I was 10 by the time I learned how to solder and I built uh, an audio amplifier from a kit, you know, so I had to build this thing and it worked, you know, and I thought that's pretty cool. And then when I was 12, I got my amateur radio license so that, too, was a big influence on me for a couple of reasons. One was because, you know, I couldn't afford state-of-the-art equipment on a kid's income, you know, an allowance. And so I ended up buying really old stuff that needed a lot of work to make it functional or building it myself from scratch. So that was sort of by necessity that I learned that part of it. And another aspect of that was that this was all in Morse code, not voice, Ah, uh -huh. um, which in retrospect was great ear training, particularly because the, um, the, the ancient receivers that I had weren't able to separate a conglomeration of signals that were, you could hear all at once, you know? So, you had, you had to, to learn how to pick out those individual. That's right. You yeah, had to learn to yeah. focus on whatever characteristic of that was the easiest to do, which could be the pitch of it, could be the speed of it. It could be some idiosyncrasy in the sound of that signal, whatever it took. And so when I got to re you know start recording things myself, it was pretty easy for me to just block out everything and listen to what that guitar part was doing. Uh, yeah, or that, or those those vocal harmonies. Oh, your third's a little bit off there. Things like that, where you can really hone in on a certain part, right? Right. Yeah. And, and just like you're saying, playing an instrument, eventually, you don't give that any thought at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just automatic. It's part of what you do. Yeah, yeah. And I think being able to, you know, the same way that, that musician prepares for so many years in a left brain mode for those right brain moments. I think the design philosophy of putting together a studio, putting together an environment, you know, I know that you went through a number of different studios of your own over the years and I'm sure that, you know, and we'll get into how the technology changed all of that in a moment, but, but I think that one thing that you mentioned in previous conversations and uh, in your own podcast as well is the idea of creating an environment where you don't have to think about that. You know, it's like when I've been in a session as a producer versus when I've been in a, a session as an engineer, those are two completely different mindsets. And it's really hard to do both at the same time. Yeah, it really is. And, um, you know, I've been doing that all along. So when I have the luxury, and, and lately I do have the luxury because I, I no longer have a commercial studio. I just have my own studio and I just do projects I want to do. 
with the people I want to work with. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a luxury that the few few people ever get, but yeah. I'm fortunate to have that at this stage of my life. And um, I do have a second engineer who's, who's worked with me on just about every project since uh, the mid 1980s. And I can pretty much say, here, sit down, do this. I just want to focus on listening uh-huh. or I want to spend my time out in the studio with the players, you know? So that's definitely makes that um, role as producer a lot easier when you, you don't have to think about the technology part of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really true. And I think, you know, I, I have, I have compared it to the idea of trying to drive and read a map at the same time. You know, it's just, it's really, really difficult to engage both parts of the brain and give them both a fair shake, I think. Yeah. Well, multitasking is a myth. And, <laughs> you know, yep. I, I learned that when I was, uh, training for my pilot's license, you mm. know, which is pretty much the ultimate multitasking environment. Sure. And, uh, you know, you're sort of forced into um, controlling the airplane, which is like playing your instrument. You know, eventually it becomes second nature and you don't give it any thought like driving. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you've got to figure out they just given you instruction to go to this particular intersection. Well, where is that? How do I get to that? You know, so you got, but you still have to fly the airplane. So you just shift back and forth and back and forth. Right. And it's like the I drummer th- all of a sudden switching to five, four on you or something, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. So yeah, there's definitely that aspect to it. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the technology because you have, as you say, you started out in an environment that was, that was mono and that was really much more akin to the, concept of capturing a live performance and as multi-track has evolved as all of the other accoutrements of today's recording you know uh digital audio workstations the the idea of being able to undo things the idea of being able to use midi all of these other tools the whole process has changed creatively how how has that changed for you well it's definitely changed you know and that brings up one other thing before I answer your specific question, and that is music has always depended on technology because even long before there was sound recording, I mean, look at a piano. Look at a piano, exactly. <laughs> it's the ultimate it's, machine right there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's technology. Mm-hmm. So uh, technology pervades music and always has. And, um, you know, it did. I, when I first heard something in stereo and a pair of headphones, I just said, this is amazing. This is so much better. And so all my recording was from that point on always in in stereo, even though up through the mid 1970s, most pop music was still recorded mono and stereo. Sure. And, and the mono was what you listened to and the mono is what you mixed. You know, the stereo was, um, yeah, we'll pan stuff some different way and then hit the record button on the two track, you know, right. but the Drums mono over here, was, vocals over here. Yeah. That kind of disconcerting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tried not to do that, but that's that, a lot of it ended up that way uh, on, on a lot of, a lot of things people did back then. Um but my first studio, when I opened the doors to that studio in 1969, was four track, four track on half inch Ampex machine. I didn't have a console. I mean, consoles at that point really were a pretty new concept. They were mostly handmade, purpose built. Right. Like bake light knobs and everything. Nobody heard of faders. Yeah. Right. They, yeah, they were uh, either um, built in house or somebody you contracted to build it, mm-hmm. or they were modified broadcast consoles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I started my studio, I couldn't afford um, a console, which, you know, even back then was just an outrageous amount of money. And so I, I had started working 
in high school at a radio station as an engineer. And this is back in the days. And I, I picked this station to work for just because it was such old time radio. I just really, that really appealed to me, uh -huh. uh, the magic of radio, because they had programs that came from five different studios during the day. And the uh, there was a one studio was the whole first floor of the building and it had a live audience for a talk show at night. It was a pretty neat place to work. But it had been, uh, the, the studios at that point had been built in 1946. Station goes back to the 20s, but this was 1946 construction. And it was entirely from the microphone to the antenna vacuum tubes. There were no transistors in that building, wow. not a single one. Um, and the consoles from back then, there were RCA consoles, and uh, you know they had like all the mic preamps and the summing amps and everything were in a rack in the back of the control room. Basically, the console itself was just a bunch of faders and switches and knobs. Um, and all those outboard mic preamps uh, became obsolete when they replaced a couple of those consoles with newer ones that had the preamps. It was still tube, but they were inside the console. Uh -huh. And so the station had all these leftover mic preamps that they didn't need anymore. And I convinced the chief engineer to sell me those mic preamps. So I had about, I don't know, maybe 10 of those from there and a few others. I can't even remember where I got, but most of them were RCA, but there were other ones in there too. I had a couple of old Ampex 300 series machines, which had really nice mic preamps in the electronics. Mm -hmm. And I used those and a passive mixer. And that was my first console. And, you know, when the day came when I could actually afford a real console, and, and it was only a couple of years, but it seemed like a long time waiting. And um, I got the new console, you know, beautiful thing, 24 inputs, 16 outputs, you know, EQ on every channel, all, all the things that I never had before. All those luxuries, yeah. All those luxuries. <clears throat> and the first session I did, I, I just invited some friends and musicians I work with all the time. I said, come on, let's just goof around and so I get to use this thing before I have paying customers in right. here. A shakedown session, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And we did that. And like, as soon as we started, I just said, what is wrong? <laughs> so this does not sound good. What, what have I spent? And back then it was like $26,000. And I'm thinking, what did I just spend 20, which is the equivalent of a couple hundred thousand today, Easily. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it doesn't sound good. I don't like the way this sounds. And, um, uh, you know, I called up the manufacturer and I said, you know, I'm not sure this is working right. It really sounds funny to me. And, you know, and, and the, 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 the guy at the manufacturer says to me, well, you know, you're just used to vacuum tubes and all the problems with vacuum tubes. You don't know what it really sounds like. And now you're, for the first time, you're actually hearing what it sounds like. And I thought, Eh, that sounds bogus to me, but okay, I'll I'll try to get used to this. <laughs> you know, well, mm. I never did. You know, I mean, even when I was 24 track a few years later and doing big record company business, I was still patching, you know, two mic preamps right into the tape track because it just sounded better to me that way. Well, you know, and it's funny because if you fast forward to today, where consoles have more or less obsoleted themselves with the advent of digital audio workstation, but almost anybody will, will champion the idea of having a good front end, you know, getting, getting, capturing those sounds, regardless of what medium you choose to put them into to work with them, capturing them, having a good front end, having a great microphone and a great preamp, has kind of withstood the test of time. 
Yeah, it's true. And uh, that's been really good for me with sure. <laughs> my, my products, you know. Um, but that's true. I think consoles have become sort of this eye candy for clients more than useful devices. Well, I have to laugh because, you know, I I have conversations sometimes with friends of mine who work in these major studios. And, you know, sometimes they'll get a session and they're using two channels you right. know, of a 96 channel console, you know, because everything's been done already. And, you know, you, you're just pulling up the, the return from Pro Tools, more or less, you know. Yeah. But um, but I think that's really true. You know, you um, you still have to adhere to certain tenets of the laws of physics. And part of that is, can I achieve that capture of that sound in the same way that you heard it as a young child in a concert hall? Yeah, well, that was always my goal. Yeah, I, I should say in defensive consoles, there's something really nice about the tactile abilities you have on a console, especially if you want to move a bunch of faders at once, Absolutely. you can just reach over and grab them. Absolutely. And that's why uh, I'm a big proponent of control surfaces. I've, I've got yeah. a, got a, con, I've got 24 channels of control surface behind me because, you know, same thing. I, I love working in logic because it's very intuitive. I can do a lot of things that I could never do with tape, but for me personally, I cannot get past the idea of wanting my fingers on faders. It's an right. instrument. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, when you're busy doing sessions all day long and maybe all night long, there isn't a whole lot of time to do much else. But on those occasions when I would have some time free, I would work on, you know, figuring out how to make something work better. And, uh, you know, my first approach to that was mic preamps because you know, like you said, if you lose it there, forget it. You're you're yeah. never getting it back. Yep. So that's got to be right. And uh, so I, I looked at, uh, you know, the few, I didn't have many of them left, but a few of these mic preamps that I had, there were different finish. Some of them were back from the 1930s. And they were noisy and microphonic and just awful, limited frequency response, a lot of distortion. But they did have some some degree of magic to them and uh, studied those and a bunch of others that I could get my hands on and just saying, well, this was a good idea. This was a smart move here that they did this, but why did they go so cheap on that? Because, you know, for another 50 cents in parts, you can make this so much better. So eventually I said, I'm just going to start from scratch and just design something that you know, fulfills my um, my vision of what a mic preamp should do and sound like and how it should perform. And uh, and I was basically building it for myself, but sort of in the back of my mind was, well, you know, if this thing really is something uh, that other people would appreciate, then maybe I could make it into a product. And I have to say, it sort of appealed to me working with a tangible product because, as you know, in the recording studio, you don't walk out the door with, with, or, or ship something off to somebody in a box at the, at the end of the day. It's, it's kind of all nebulous, especially these days. At least in the old days, you had a roll of tape. But, uh, you know, I, it just sort of appealed to me as sort of a totally different direction for me to go. Well, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, too, because you you have in a certain sense embraced the best of both worlds, both the, you know, the, the modern concept of capturing the sound, but also, you know, you're working with tubes, you're working with, with components that, you know, there, as you say, a lot of the older stuff, it's kind of funky, you know, I mean, we, mm -hmm. we tend to, as human beings, we tend to, wax nostalgic about certain things you know like like driving an old car you know i mean i love seeing you know a 1940 something buick driving down the street but if i think about the idea of how much work goes into maintaining that shit every mm -hmm. single day you know there's the old joke about 
working on it all week to drive it on the weekends, you know, and it's a similar concept with a lot of the, a lot of the older gear, you know, you pull up some of those old broadcast compressors and, and whatnot from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And a lot of that stuff is, it was horrible. I mean, you know, it was microphonic. Yes, it was, you know, the sound would vary depending on the time of day, how warm it was, you know, what day of the week it was. And those kind of variables, they were really great in retrospect in terms of, wow, this, this old gear was really great to work with. But the reality is you have to find a way to approach that sonic clarity but with a certain dependability and a certain character that actually works in modern day recording. And I think that's, that's been sort of a tenet of the way you design things that I, that I find both fascinating and almost unnerving. I mean, you know, you, you, you're working with, to a certain extent, old ideas, but you're making them work in a modern context. Yeah. Well, again, that, gives me a million things to, to comment <laughs> on here. <laughs> um, That's my job, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I knew when I started seriously working on the preamp design in the early 1990s, that digital was going to take over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, personally, I, I spent just, it's just about half and half now between tape and digital in my yes. career. Yes. And, uh, there's a lot of things to like about tape, but I do not miss it. You know, that was just a whole lot of work and so many, so many limitations to it and so on. So, so many limitations. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, just in the way you recorded, there were limitations just because of the pre-emphasis going into the machine. You had to be really careful of highs because the piano would saturate, you know, it, at minus 10 on the VU meter, the, the transients on a piano are saturated. Sure. On a tape Not machine. to mention the editing process. Well, yeah, that's another thing, too. Yeah. Um, so I knew that, that whatever I did had to be up to the standards of digital re recording. Mm -hmm. And in because of vintage gear, uh, I think a lot of people have this notion that it's noisy, distorted, and, and that's the sound, you know? And... You have to remember back when that stuff was designed, uh, well, say for broadcast, it only had to go to five kilohertz. That's all that was required for AM broadcast. Exactly. We were listening to it on AM radio. We were listening to it on, on much lower standards in terms of playback equipment. Right, right. And, you know, a, a AM um, broadcast station, or actually basically any broadcast station, didn't have to have the ultra low distortion that we we say you know i always tell people that the sound of even the best fm station would cause a recording session with that sound to grind to a halt send everybody up for lunch till they found out what was wrong yes you yes. know all the natural so, compression and everything else going on yeah yeah mm -hmm. so um th there really wasn't that much pressure to to make things better. I mean, some some companies took it seriously, like Fairchild with their the 660, 670. I mean, that's a pretty serious piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. Ampex, you know, they they did their very best to make that really high quality stuff, but a lot of the stuff wasn't that great. And a lot of that was pearls before swine because there were a lot of people who really were not in the position to appreciate that yeah. degree of clarity. Absolutely. I mean, they didn't even have the monitoring facilities to tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, but I wanted, you know, to make the stuff I designed as good as it could be. And, you know, one of the things that I realized right away studying the designs of all this stuff, and it made perfect sense for the manufacturer at the time, but somebody in marketing says, you know, this can't cost more than $50 to build. And so they designed it, whatever it took to come in under that $50 price tag. Right. You know, they were going to sell it for $750, but, you know, the, the parts and labor costs had to be like that. 
Mm-hmm. And when I started, I said, I don't have that constraint. I don't have to build to a price. Right. I'm making uh, this for me. I, I'm making this for me. And I'm making this for people that are going to appreciate the difference. Mm-hmm. You know, and I built stuff, designed and built stuff that would have a minimum 50 year lifespan. You know, and, you know, some things like like the Fairchilds and the Ampex and stuff, they were built well enough that they they've held up pretty well if you take care of them. Yeah, there are still plenty of them in service. Yeah. Um, But today and that and, I, you know, I'm not blaming the, the manufacturers for this, there's no point in making some digitally based device last for more than five years or so, because it's going to be obsolete. Yeah. So there's no pressure to do that. Now, the problem, of course, when you do that without compromise is it costs a whole lot of money because the parts are expensive, the construction's expensive, and it just ends up being very high priced. But you know, for the people that can really appreciate that difference, they understand that it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, if you think about it, most of the professionals in our industry, they may not even be working on a big SSL console anymore or anything like that, but most of them are carrying around a good mic collection and a good collection of front end gear for that yeah. very reason. Yep. Because that's, that's where right. you invest it, and and it's true, you know, if you don't if you don't get it right at the capture stage, there's nothing that's going to help you. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's going to be a whole lot of work to make that acceptable if it's messed up at that point. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you know I I see that in your design philosophy. I see that, and and of course you know there are there are others in the industry who also adhere to that, and I I applaud everyone who pays attention to that because I think that is. That is, to me, the point at which we are really capturing the art. And if we can't capture it right, if we can't have the conditions to really get it right at the front end, it's never going to be right after that. Yeah, that's true. And one of the things that that when I was teaching a recording class, I told people was, you know, your job is to do as little damage to this music as possible. Yes, Yes, that is that is the I mean, it's interesting because I've had that conversation with a number of producers and we we all agree on that, too. You know, it's 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 the physician's creed. It's do no harm. Right. You know, capture the moment, capture the artistry as best you can, because you're not going to get another chance to get that magic into the box. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, and that applies to to microphones as well, because. you have to understand your microphones and refine your collection to reflect, you know, your sense of what things should sound like. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, I've gotten rid of almost all my condenser mics. I probably only have 10 of them left. Interesting. And, it, and it's all ribbon mics now. Uh-huh. I just love the sound. I, I always did. I mean, I had old RCA 44s in my studio, you know, that were, a dime a dozen because nobody wanted them. You could go into any radio station. They were sitting in a drawer somewhere because <laughs> we're in a closet, you know, and say, do, do you need these? Nah, we're never going to use those again. Well, I, I have to laugh. I had a, um, I had an incident uh, many, many years ago. I, uh, I had been signed to BMG in Germany and I had moved over to Hamburg and I was working with, a particular producer in Berlin. And he was showing me his collection of vintage Neumann microphones. And he was telling me that, yeah, right after the wall went down, he took a trip out to um, a part of East Germany that had formerly been in communist, under communist control, right near the Polish border. And he said he walked into a shop and he found one of those old, uh, what they used to call the bottle Mm -hmm. microphone Mm -hmm. and he asked the owner of the shop he said you know what do you want for this and the guy said oh that old crap you know i don't you can take it for free i got a whole box of you know a whole box of parts and everything and he said you know i felt bad i didn't want to take it for free 
he ended up trading the guy like a couple of SM58s for essentially <laughs> two working microphones and a whole bunch of parts, you know, which would be worth literally thousands and thousands of dollars because nobody wanted to play with that old stuff. Right. Well, that, you know, at one point in, in my studio days, I had a, <clears throat> a, 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 another studio in Philadelphia that was closing its doors. The guy was retiring and just wanted to get rid of everything. So I went in there and I, I bought basically everything in, in the place, um, mainly because he was so anxious to get rid of it. You know, it was like, name your price. Right. You know, and I came across, he had sold all the mics before I got there, which, which was okay. But I, I'm looking around and I come across an M49 in a desk drawer. And I said, what, what about this, this mic? He says, ah, that thing doesn't work. Take it. Same, same thing. Nobody valued them yeah. at that point. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think that is, um, of course, that has changed now over time as people have started to realize that. But I think, again, that also reflects your design philosophy and the stuff you're making now, because you're trying to capture the essence of that. And at the same time, you're trying to give it sort of a modern bent in terms of it being both useful now and still still maintaining that same sonic clarity and i think that's that's a challenge in itself you know because you're really you're 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 dealing with stuff that is captured under completely different conditions now you're dealing with different types of artists different types of music you know and obviously there are certain things that hold true beyond, beyond it all yeah well i think i think there's a lot of truth to that and uh you know, when I first started on the mic preamp quest, I was going to do it with solid state because I figured tubes are hard to find. You know, there are just so many drawbacks. I didn't think it was an avenue worth pursuing. Not to mention the consistency factor of tubes. Yeah, true. Um, that's another thing I can mention if we if we, if we get a chance to plug that in. <laughs> Uh, but I built so many solid state mic preamps, all different typologies and different approaches to it and everything. And they sounded okay. I mean, they sounded as good as any console preamp hmm. and, uh, but they didn't do what I wanted, you know, and, and really because I had listened to some of the old recordings that I had done, you know, 40 years earlier with all tube gear, 100% all the way through. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I mean, the, the recordings weren't that great because the performers weren't all that great. I wasn't working with the best people back then. Some of them got a lot better over the years, but at that stage, you know, it wasn't that great. And, uh, but there was just something about that sound. And I just said, we've lost that. We just absolutely have lost that. I'm going to get it back. Mm -hmm. And not too long ago, I was, it was actually at a party and I was talking to this guy who's uh, basically a physicist, not in music at all. And we were talking about this. He just knows so much about so many things. I just always enjoy talking to him. And uh, he was saying, well, you know, a vacuum tube is a true analog device. Uh -huh. And he says, yeah. he says, transistors are not really that way because of the quantum effects or whatever. He explained it all. I, a, a lot of it was just too deep into the physics for me to really uh, remember the details. But mm. I said, well, that <laughs> probably explains a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, therein therein lies the the whole left right brain conflict right there. You know, how deep do you get into the physics of it? But it does actually impact the creativity process because if you're not hearing it right, you're going to play differently. Well, that's absolutely true, and I I tell people that all the time that. You know, if if you're recording somebody and either in their headphones or they come in to listen to the playback and it sounds great to them, they're going to go back out there and do the next take even better because now they're pumped up. 
Sure, sure. And that's, you know, it's funny because uh, as we have now evolved to studio technology that enables everybody to give to basically dial up their own headphone mix, I think that's kind of a mixed blessing too, because having a certain control over that headphone mix, I think, again, you're impacting the, the performer. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I, you've just really hit on something that's very important to me because it, I would say for 95% of the sessions I do, I give everybody the same mix that I've got Absolutely. that I'm listening to. Absolutely. And 95% of the time, nobody ever says a word. And I've stopped saying, I said, everybody here okay? Headphones okay? Because everybody says, yeah, sure, they're fine. You know, I mean, some of that's a reflection of the caliber of the people I'm working with. <laughs> You know, because it seems like the less experienced people are, the more they seem to have trouble with headphones. But I'm amazed with studio players how you can give them almost any feed and they're fine. <laughs> and they'll learn to work with it. Yeah. 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 I have found that it, yeah, it's sometimes it's inexperienced players. And then occasionally it's if somebody has a certain case of tinnitus or something like that, where, right, right. you know, they really need to hear certain frequencies over others or whatnot. But for the most part, man, you know, if you're a, an experienced player, you've already learned how to hone in on, you know, if you're if you're the bass player, you've learned how to hone in on the kick drum or whatever it is. You know, you've you've got that down to the point where you can transcend a lot of that. Absolutely. And you know what I always say is give them not what they want, but what they need. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because a lot of times even experienced players don't really know what they need. And you can often tell that just by the way they're playing. Oh, yeah. You know, sort yeah. of the classic example is when you have a singer that's straining, they're not hearing themselves enough. So just pump up the vocal a little in their headphones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the on the other hand, if, if they're singing like, too softly, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah it's mm -hmm. too loud. Turn it down. Yeah. I mean, that applies to everybody, but it's, I think it's easiest to envision that with a vocalist. Sure, sure. But, you know, that's and, and of course, that also goes back to the creative process and, you know, how how people are in terms of listening to the rest of the group they're working with. You know, I mean, there are there are ensemble players and there are soloists. Right. Yeah. Well. You know, I've been through all that, and I'm just very lucky these days that I don't have to work with people like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, having come through that, you learn a lot of valuable lessons, you know, and you, you learn a lot of valuable lessons also about human nature and the psychology behind that whole creative process, because, you know, you're, you're really it's not just a matter of doing no harm. It's also a matter of creating an environment where people feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, I think that's a really good point. I would not trade away all those years of lousy sessions just because I learned something from every one of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's, you know, anybody who doesn't have horror stories about coming up and doing lousy sessions hasn't done enough sessions. Right. <laughs> Yeah, either that or they've just been way too lucky. <laughs> oh, you know, I but I, I think even if you've been lucky, you know, you've learned a lot because I think that to me is really the essence of the creative process. It's, it's you know, it's part of its gear, but part of it is just in here. Part of it is interpersonal communications and just understanding the artist as a human being and all of what's going through their heads and, you know, gaining their trust. And I think that's, that's a part of the production process as well. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I've been in sessions with producers that were just, you know, had no sensitivity whatsoever to, to the, uh, the performers and especially, you know, the creative force behind it, whoever the so singer is, songwriter, what, what a soloist, whatever. And they just, uh, you know, they were just going to ram this through and, and they ended up with lousy sounded stuff. It's true. It's true. And, and, you know, a lot of them, they'll compensate for it by, you know, for example, playing more of the parts themselves or whatever. And I think that's kind of a mistake because you're, 
you're not giving the music the chance to really grow. You know, one of the things that I have always been big on is uh, after I've listened to the song a few times in the room with the mm-hmm. musicians so mm-hmm. that you can hear what it sounds like there, you know, you, you turn to the singer or the songwriter and you say, you know, what, what's this song about? What was in your head mm-hmm. when you, you know, because by getting them to talk about that, you're going to get a better performance out of them. That's true. And, you know, for me, the people I work with are people I'm producing and whoever the songwriter is long before we're in the studio, I've listened to their demo, uh, you know, multiple times. And if there's something about it, I didn't understand. I'd ask them, Yeah, you know, and say, you know, what was going through your head on this? Where, where did this idea come from? You know, what does this really mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, some of it you have to be a little bit careful of, you know, depending on the person you're dealing with, because on the one hand, they may be offended that you didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand, th- th- it may be too personal for them to really talk about. Sure. So, you know, you have to have a little bit of sensitivity to that. But, uh, you know, if you have a good rapport with who you're working with, that kind of insight is really valuable. I think so. I think so. So, so circling back to your design philosophy, mm-hmm. how has that, how has that understanding of the creative process influenced the way you have approached approached things as a designer of the front end gear. Uh, good question. It's, um, I don't differentiate it. I mean, it's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's finding the sound that appeals to me. And Mm -hmm. if I listen to recordings I did 50 years ago, uh, they're, they're essentially the same aesthetic as what I do today. You know, which sometimes I say, wow, I haven't made any progress in all these years. <laughs> I'm <laughs> well, still doing the same thing. <laughs> but there's a transparency there. And I right. think that's that's what I really, I think is valuable, is it that same transparency that we're talking about in, in, in being able to pull that performance out. Uh, it seems like you address you address the design of the equipment in the same with the same ethos. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, for me, everything I've ever designed is for me. You know, and there's a few things in this room that didn't turn out to be products, but I use all the time just because there's really not a market for it. Uh Um, But the majority of things that I've designed ended up being pretty well accepted in the marketplace, which is, you know, kind of amazing to me in a lot of ways. Uh, but it was all designed to, you know, reflect what I thought things should sound like, whether it's the mic preamp, an equalizer, compressor, DI, you know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. I, I have a sound in my mind, and that's what I go for. And you know, in my shop, I think a lot of people are kind of amazed when they look at my shop because there's not much test equipment in there, but there are good monitor speakers in uh-huh. there, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, and, you know, I, I would say that to me, I use test equipment to keep me going from going down the wrong path too far. But after that, it's just what does it sound like? And it's not like, what does it sound like right now? It's like, what what if I use this for six months, listen to it every day or every, you know, several times a week, is this still exactly what I want? And for example, the equalizers, the VT4 and VT5 equalizers, those were designed, you know, entirely by ear, just by listening to stuff. And I mean, I had some I had a notion of what what I wanted it to do, but the fine tuning of that was all by ear. And, you know, I I would be in the shop or in the control room and listening to something and say, you know, this frequency, it it might sound better, just a tiny bit higher. Mm -hmm. So I go grab a different capacitor out of the bin and 
clip lead it in in place of what was there. Say, yeah, that's better, I think. Let's listen to that for a while. But, you know, it, that's funny because I've always, uh, you know, I, I, I used to write a lot of blog posts for a number of different companies. And one of the things that I would conclude almost every column with was the thought that your most important instruments are your ears and that really, you know, you can look at the screen, you can look at the meters and everything, but ultimately I close my eyes. Right. I close my eyes and I listen because that's really what is the bottom line. How does it yeah. sound? Right. Yeah, we're not making equipment for test equipment. We're making equipment for people to listen to. For humans to listen to through ears. Yes, right. exactly. And on the EQ, you know, I had a pretty good notion of where the frequencies were, but I didn't know exactly where they ended up. Uh -huh. So, so um, I eventually measured them so I could put some labels on the panel <laughs> <laughs> and just pick the nearest, closest standard right. kind of frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know what the curves were like at all. You know, I, I, I had a notion of what they were like, but I didn't, I never measured them. And I never really knew until uh, the guys from Acoustica, the plug-in manufacturer, mm -hmm. were doing a plug-in version of the, the VT5 equalizer. And they came here for a couple of days sampling that and, and, you know, sending me copies. We went round and round and round for two years before we got it to its huh. final form. And Only two years, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, they're really good. <laughs> they are really good. And um, at one point, they sent me all the graphs of all the curves for the EQ, which I had never seen before. And I, I was surprised. I looked at them and said, those look pretty nice. That's just about exactly what I would have pictured. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it new... wasn't important to me to know what those were. Well, there, there's a there's a viability to the intuitive approach. You know, yeah. which yeah. especially if you've been listening to music your entire life, you know, one would hope that you have a certain a certain judgment factor there that that works. Right. Right. And, you know, that exposure to live music is so vital. Oh, yeah. And when I had my studio, I had a, st a very small staff. It was maybe 10 or 12 people. And once a year, I would take them all to a Philadelphia Orchestra concert. I'd pay for them, all their seats. And we'd get good seats and we'd sit there. Some of the people said, I don't, I hate that music. I don't want to go hear that. You know, they, they wanted to do the, the uh, the punk sessions they were right, doing, you know, right. they were they were great at that. They thought there's nothing in classical music that would be a value to them, and so some of them went very reluctantly. But I said, you know, I don't care if you like the music or not. Ignore that. Just listen to what it sounds like, you know. And then tomorrow we're, we're going to just spend a few minutes and talk about it. And and I think that 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 opened up their ears when they they realized. Uh, what real music sounds like, because so often we're, we just don't hear it anymore. Well, and, you know, that was, for me, part of the irony of beginning to teach the recording process was the idea of really pushing, pushing my students to do some critical listening, to really take things apart and listen to how things interacted with other parts. And really, I think that is that is so valuable because, you know, so many of us, and particularly in this age of recording, where everything is kind of, you know, we're working off of pre-recorded bits, you know, I think to be able to take that apart down to the component level, quote unquote, you know, to be able to listen to what that French horn is doing in relation to the other horns, let alone in relation to the rest of the orchestra, Um you know, so many heavy metal guitarists are into classical music, you know, for the same reason. I think the idea of being able to really critically listen to the parts and how they come together, that's that's invaluable in any kind of music. Yeah, I, I, there's no question about it. Yeah. Um, you know, and one of the things, too, that I think we've lost in this age of uh, digital recording is 
that lack of distraction. You know, the the yeah. one of the consoles I had during my days had a switch on it to shut off the VU meters, which when I got it, I said, why? Why would you shut off the VU meters, you know? And then one day I'm sitting there and I'm we're listening to something back and I'm just staring at all the meters, <laughs> you know, and and I knew what was on each one of them, but I was just sort of curious about what, you know, how's that reacting to this or whatever. And I said, wow, I'm not listening to the music anymore. I said, that's what that switch is for. Well, you multiply that by a thousand and that's the way we record today. Which not to mention a- waveforms. Right. You know, I you're mean, watching waveforms go by. And that's I was actually having this conversation on social media with somebody earlier today. And I said, you know, I have been known to turn off the monitor. Right. Well, I, I know some really big name mixers who have, you know, a hot key or something to, to shut everything down just so they don't have that distraction when they're trying to listen. Sure. And uh, I tend to do that, too. But, you know, I get people saying to me, uh, you know, asking me questions about, you know, some arcane thing in, in their DAW. And I said, does it sound good? Yeah, I guess so. I said, well, don't look at that and just listen yeah. to it. Does it still sound good? Yeah. If you know, it, sounds if it sounds good, good you don't good, have a problem. Right. If it sounds good, it is good. Don't worry about what the waveform looks like. Well, and, you know, you know, to a certain extent, sometimes sometimes we want that. Sometimes, you know, I'm I'm always uh, I'm always fascinated by you know the story of uh, the Beatles plugging in uh, plugging directly into the console to overdrive their guitars for uh, the recording of Revolution, you know, right. and mm-hmm. you know the guys in the BBC. Uh, you know, the, 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 the white smocks, you know, coming in from EMI studios, they're all freaking out about it, you know, cause it breaks the, the rules, but ultimately right. this is what I'm going for. This is the sound I'm going for. And if it takes something unorthodox and it takes breaking those rules, then so be it. That's right. And I think that's uh, a good thing for anybody at any stage of their career is to break the rules and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, 90% of the time you'll say, well, I see why that rule exists. <laughs> but, you know, there's 10% of the time you say, well, that sounds pretty cool. I, it might not be appropriate for this project, but I'm going to keep that in mind. Exactly. Exactly. Because it worked for this particular thing. Yeah. 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 So um, I'll ask you the same, the same closing question I ask a lot of people. You're 15 years old coming up in the industry now. What advice would you give yourself? Well, you know, there's the old saying that if you want to write well, read good material, you know, and I I often find myself reading something that's so poorly written. I'm thinking, man, this is this is not good for my brain. (laughs) (laughs) I got to stop reading. I got to stop reading this. Yep. You know, and I think the same thing applies to music. I mean, listen to the good stuff. And when you come across something and, you know, at the beginning, you won't know the difference, really. Uh, you may have a sense of it. I mean, I think people have unconscious reactions to stuff that they don't access early in their career. Yeah, subconscious bullshit detectors. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you listen to stuff that, well, I mean, if it's been a huge success and is used as a model for a great recording, listen to that stuff, you know? And that doesn't mean you're going to copy that. You shouldn't copy that. You know, I mean, maybe as an exercise to learn how to do something like that, but you don't want to sound like that. You want to sound like what you do. So I think it's important to develop your own style, but use all those great uh, uh, things that came before, you know, study what they did and listen to them and, and see what, what good can you take from that? And then there's also the aspect of, that self-evaluation thing, you know, I do this at at the end of every session, you know, usually like later in the day, maybe when I'm in bed, I think, all right, what went great in this session? What could have been better? And what did I learn? You know, and I, I, I go through that every single time because if you're not learning something, you're, you're not doing it right. You got to be learning every single time. 
That's true. And I think corollary to that is not just doing the self-reflection immediately afterward, but maybe pulling it up a month later, a year later, whatever. And, and, you know, because I think a lot of times we're so caught up in the learning process that we don't realize how far we've come until we look behind us. Well, yeah, I'm sure you've had the experience where you agonized over some minute sound modification or, you know, level change or whatever it might be. <laughs> Spent hours and hours on it, listening to all kinds of different environments and playing around with it. And then you listen to that six months later and you say, that sounds pretty good. You don't even remember what you were working on. You know, you may have been frustrated at the time. This, I, I can't get this right. This is not right. You listen to it later and you say, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah. And then other times, conversely, where you've done something that you really consider almost a throwaway and, you know, people rave over that. Yeah. Well, it's perspective. Yeah. 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 And I think we get too much caught up in the quality of the recording versus the quality of the music. You know, because if you have really good music, that, that can tolerate a lot of lousy recording. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, listen to some of those old Motown recordings. I mean, technically oh, I speaking, they're absolutely awful. Some I know. Of them, you know. Uh, yeah, a friend of mine's remixing a lot of that stuff, and I've sat there with them and and listened to the, the original tracks, and it's they were not terrible. I've heard far worse. Well, but, yes. Yes. But but they're not as pristine as, but as technically you might think. speaking. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. technical aspect of it that we agonize over, ultimately, a lot of that stuff is really it's it's extraneous. Right. But it's not worthless because mm -hmm. for, for a couple of reasons, like we talked about before, people hearing um, themselves, their performance sound really good is, is going to energize them. Yeah. And the other thing is that I truly believe that even somebody, you know, listening in the car with the windows open, there's subtleties in that music that are important and they'll never be able to articulate that, but they just know they like it. And yeah, I think those yeah. are the things we have to strive for. That's true. And that is, you know, sometimes I, I wish that I could listen with that non-critical ear that many of those people can listen with. You yeah, know, I know. We are so we are so trained to really tune into those fine points and you know sometimes to our own detriment. Well I have to tell you I have a a curse <laughs> a curse on my life and that is when I play something for somebody for whatever reason I'm hearing it through their ears. Mm. And that can be like totally deflating, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, if you're playing something, somebody you know really likes it, you feel that, and you just say, "Wow, this is reaching this person." You know, if you can make somebody cry listening to it, then you know you've reached them. Uh, but so many times, you know, music to to the average person is just this commodity noise, you know. Obviously, there's many exceptions. There's people that are really dedicated fans, but for most people, that's not the case. They either like the song or they don't. They they probably can't even tell you who the artist is most of the time. Right, and also they're hearing that completed product. They're not hearing all of the intricacies. They're not hearing all of the. They're not hearing how you labored over that drum sound or that bass part or any of that stuff. They're just hearing the entire thing as one cohesive unit. Does right. it sound good or not? Right. Do they like the song or not? Right. Does it have you know, a good the, beat? Can I give it an 85? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Do I like the singer's voice? You know, yeah. whatever, whatever it might be. Are those lyrics speaking to me or, or not? Yeah. And uh, but I don't think that's any excuse for us to not do as the best we possibly can, because for one thing, it's for our own, you know, gratification, because let's face it, we do a lot of this stuff because we love it. We love it when it sounds great. Yeah. That, that's what motivates us. Sure. Um, for me, a lot of times when I'm mixing something, I think about, you know, my peers in the industry, you know, I have a few people that I often send things to what I'm working on just because I think they'll enjoy hearing it for whatever reason. And so 
a lot of times I'm thinking about them as I'm doing the mix. It's like, how's he going to react to this? Yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. because, you know, Daniel, we get into a rarefied level here of audio. Yes. Where, where there's really a very, very, very small subset of humans that even understand what we do. Yes. You know, so it's, it. I think it's really valuable to have that give and take with your peers whenever you can. If you have somebody that, you know, you trust their taste and, you know, they'll tell you when it sounds lousy or say, you know, you know, try a little less reverb on that part, you know, or whatever <laughs> it might be. Yep. It's yep. just really valuable. Agreed. But, but playing stuff for just the average person, it's, uh, you know, I don't wish what I experience on anybody because it can be really pretty devastating, but it is valuable to me. Yeah. And I think for younger people coming up, I think those are things that they will need to learn and need to adjust to and, and understand because the more we get into it, the more we, the more isolated we are in a certain sense. And we don't realize what the average quote unquote lay person is hearing and how that differs from what we hear. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, my mix process, I almost always at some point put the mix through, you know, my equivalent of computer speakers. I mean, Mm. laptop speakers really is almost as bad as it gets. And then I walk out of the control room. My shop is right next door. I leave the doors open and I sit in there and I listen to it. And that just like strips out every detail. Yes. And I say, can I understand the words? Can I hear that guitar solo? Is that guitar solo a comparable level to the vocal that comes before and after? All those kinds of things. Right. If this that, came up in a restaurant while I was eating a meal, would I, you know, how would I react to it? Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think yeah. that's really valuable. Uh, I would agree. Tool. Yeah. Yeah. Doug Fern, thank you for being my guest. Daniel, it's been a pleasure. You had great questions. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. I'm glad. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.